All right, everybody. We are pleased to have you back for another seminar um, uh, series that we're doing for our ETE um, trainings that we have for this fall. Uh, we're very pleased that um, we were able to bring in uh, our guest speaker today that I'd like to quickly introduce. And um, I think you'll, you'll all really enjoy her presentation. We've been able to have um, lunch with um, Dr. Michelle Pekansky brock Hopefully, Michelle, I'll just call her. Um, and uh, we had lunch with her today, and she, she engaged us in a very interesting conversation about how we can humanize our classroom and engage with our students much better. So um, just some quick history on her. She's, she's definitely a leader in higher education, especially in online teaching, and doing some incredible faculty development programming that is being recognized across the nation um, by the Online Learning Consortium and EDUCAUSE's e-learning uh, e initiative, so ELI. And um, she works at the, Col or not Colorado, the California Community College System, and which has, the, the scale of faculty development is unprecedented compared to what we have to deal with here in our, in our small land grant institution with faculty reaching across the state. So some of her insights um, have been extremely valuable to us today in what she shared with us. She's also an author of um, The Best Practices for Teaching and Emerging, Emerging Technology technologies. And um, with that, I would like to introduce Michelle for our presentation today on humanizing learning with digital tools. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to work. Okay. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. I've really enjoyed my day here at Utah State University in Logan. It's um, I got here yesterday and I was looking on my phone trying to find my way to the inn and someone came up to me and said, can I help you find something? And I thought that's that's a sign of a very welcoming culture. So it was it was very nice, and I've enjoyed every minute of my interactions with you today. Um, so if you haven't noticed, I do have a URL where that you're free to go to, where you'll find a PDF of my slides that you can download. There's a lot of other resources there as well. I have many of the videos that will be included in my slides, provided there's links if you want to watch them again or show them to anyone and start conversations about them. Um, I also have some other resources, links to articles, and some research that will support some of what I'll be talking about today. So um, check that out when you have time. And if you have any follow-up questions for me, you can leave them at the bottom of that web page. I'm happy to respond to them. And that is brokansky.com slash USU. So we're going to get started with a little bit of a, uh, of a reflective prompt. Before I give you the prompt, I want you to know that I'm not going to ask you to share what you're going to think about with anyone else. I think it's important to just be very clear and transparent. This is a safe place. Um, so what I want you to think about, take a few moments to just reflect on your own experiences and think back to a time where you did not feel like you belonged a time when you felt like you did not belong. And try to think back to that time and really try to reflect on what that felt like, where you were, what was happening, how that felt. And I'm gonna ask you to hold on to that yucky feeling as I start presenting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll loop back to it, okay? Um, but I want to get started today with a story about this guy on the screen. This is a story um, about my dad, Jake. And uh, my dad was born in 1939 in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. He'll be 81 years old next year, and I'm very grateful he's still with us. Um, and he has a story that has influenced me and helped me understand who I am and how I fit into this world and helped me to recognize many privileges that I was born into that he didn't have. He was born into a family. Um, he was, his parents both immigrated from Slovakia, so they were new to the US. They had 16 children. He was the second to youngest. They lived in a small, rundown, three-bedroom home. And my dad, again, he was the second to youngest, and, and he was the only 
boy to graduate high school because in his family the priority was on making money, not on education. And my dad tells me stories about being uh, growing up and really just having a passion for wanting to learn. But really what it meant for my dad to learn was to read. And they did not have books in their house. He tells me stories about looking through dumpsters where he had been known to find old books and reading them by flashlight underneath his covers at night because he would get in trouble if he was found reading because it was a waste of time. So that's the environment that he grew up in. He was largely raised by his two older sisters who were next in the, the lineup in the, the kids. Um, and then when my dad graduated high school, he really had a dream, a, a passion of going to college. It was something that no one in his family had obviously done. And he wanted to make it happen, so he was starting to take some night classes in New Jersey, and he was working as a mechanic during the day and falling asleep under the cars and recognizing that something's got to give here. This isn't going to work. So my dad was talking to some friends from high school who had been talking to a football coach at his high school. And his football coach told him about these magical places in California that were giving away college for free. And those places were called community colleges. This was in the 1960s. So my dad packed up all of his belongings in New Jersey and set his eyes on a community college out in California and drove all the way across the country with all of his belongings and said goodbye to his whole family, friends, everything and enrolled in Porterville Community College um, in the Central Valley in California. And he got his AA degree at Porterville. He transferred to San Jose State University where he got his bachelor's degree and his master's degree in chemistry. And then he transferred to Iowa State and got his PhD and that's where I was born during those last few years in Iowa. And then they moved back to California and that's where I was raised and I still live today. If you were to sit down and talk to my dad about his college experience, he wouldn't talk about Iowa State. He would talk to you about Porterville College. He still has a couple of friends, most have passed, but a couple from Porterville that he stays in touch with. In fact, about five or six years ago, maybe more than that, um, him and two of his friends got in the car and drove six hours down to Porterville in their late 70s to visit the college because it had so much meaning to him. Now he came back from that experience and he said to me, Michelle, I didn't know anyone there. It was all so different. And I said, what did you expect, Dad? But the point is, the point is that it was the relationships that he had at the college there and knowing that he was able to get started there with absolutely nothing and experience this kind of social mobility that he went through because of higher education and I directly benefited. I grew up in a family with my mom and my dad. My mom stayed home. I had a safe home. I had a comfortable bed to sleep in every night. I had fresh food on the table. I didn't have to worry about any of that. And all of that is because of higher education. And all of that is also due to community colleges. So as I've started my own career in the community college system, I, I recognize that and I see now kind of where my passion for open access higher, to higher education and access oriented public universities come from. But I learned something else from that. My dad's a reader, as I mentioned. And if you were to, I bet you, hundred bucks that if I were to look at my dad through like a secret wormhole right now, he would be in his chair in his recliner reading a book. And oftentimes it's still about quantum theory. He's just fascinated by this stuff. My dad is a reader. He has hundreds of books in his house that, I mean, probably thousands that he has read over more than one time. But here's the thing. I wasn't like that growing up. I wasn't a reader. Reading was hard for me. I didn't really connect these dots until later in my life, but when I think about my dad and me, that's, some, that's a gene like I didn't get. That's, my brain doesn't have that wiring. I mean, I can read, 
but reading is hard for me. It, I'm not the kind of person who will sit down and like, if I have an open Saturday, I'm not going to read a book. I do read. I learn through reading, but it's a different kind of thing. Um, and I learned that in, actually in seventh grade when I was reading a book that our class was reading. And I read the chapter, and we had the discussion in class the next day. And the teacher, Mrs. Bennett, she asked a question, and I didn't know the answer to it. And she said, oh, well, you didn't read, you didn't do your homework. And that feeling of shame that went through my body and embarrassment, you know, I stayed in the classroom until no one else was there, and I went up to her afterwards, and I said, I promise you I did my homework. I just don't remember what I read. And she sat down with me, and she said, okay, here's what you need to do. When you're reading, you need to summarize as you go. You need to take notes. I did not want to hear that because that's a lot of work. But as I got older, especially when I got into college, I knew that she was right. And that's, that's what I do still today. When I read to retain, I really have to sit down and, and write as I'm reading. That was a lesson for me in what's called learner variability. And when we look at who succeeds easily in college, it's oftentimes the people who, who really have that ease of reading. Um, now, I've never been assessed. I don't know if I'd be like diagnosed as like on the dyslexia scale. I don't know. I mean, I figured it out for myself, and that's the way most people work. You figure out how to make it work. How to, you figure out how to get by. But there is a framework called Universal Design for Learning, um, or UDL, if you're not familiar with it. And that framework is designed to support learner variability. If you think about giving your students one way to learn, it's kind of like extending a size 8 shoe to everybody and expecting everybody to go about for the next 16 weeks wearing a size 8 shoe. It's, it's important to be thinking about learner variability as we design our courses. And digital tools actually can really empower us as educators to create different pathways for learners in a class and accommodate this learner variability. But there's more to it than that. If we look at some of the most recent research on neuroscience, we're starting to understand this really fascinating relationship between emotion and feeling and cognition. And this stuff fascinates me. Um, this is a quote from a neurologist, neuroscience, neuroscientist, Antonio Damasio. We are not thinking machines. We are feeling machines that think. That's what we're starting to understand about the human brain is this process of cognition and understanding doesn't just exist in its own sphere. It's not detached. It actually comes out of all of the feelings and experiences that we've had in life. So what's interesting to me is like when I think about how I relate to myself as a reader and thinking I'm not good at it, I go back to that moment of shame in that classroom and I start to wonder how much of that has influenced the way that I perceive my ability to read. So um, in higher education, we put a great deal of emphasis on cognition, the development of knowledge and understanding. Right? You think about Bloom's taxonomy, starting with remembering up to evaluating and analyzing the higher order thinking skills. But we really don't think a lot about the effective domain of learning. And this is something that is a big part of the presentation here today, thinking about all of the feelings and experiences that come in with a student when they sit down in, their, in your classroom or they enroll and start taking your online course. By the way, how many of you in you here teach? I'm assuming most or all of you, but I just want to be sure. OK. And how many of you teach online? OK, so a significant number of you. Thank you. Just good for me to know. So when we think about our students, a lot of them don't believe in themselves. A lot of them think they're fooling themselves by being in college. That's not true of everyone. But when you look at your retention rates in your classes, when we look at the, you know, the percentage of students that start versus the percentage of students that stop, the ones that don't make it, not all of them. I know there's lots of things that disrupt a learner's progress. But a lot of them don't make it because they fall into this rut. They carry this message, this internal dialogue, and they make a mistake. And they go, see, 
I told you so, you couldn't do it, and they stop. Um, this, is, this chart here, let me break it down for you a little bit. These, this chart shows the, the success rates of online courses in the California Community Colleges from 2015, 2016. Um, the black bar across the top that says statewide average, that's our average success rate of 66% of our courses. Our face-to-face -face success rate is about 70%. So it's about a 4% gap. 10 years ago, it was a 15% gap. So we're learning more about online classes, making them better, and that success rate is improving. But what I want to point out is that the gap below that bar, and I want to look at the demographics of students that fall below that bar. So to the left, we have our, our students who are white, and then our Asian students represented with green. The gold bars are statewide, and then the red bar are Afri African American or black students. Uh, the purple bar is our American Indian slash Alaskan natives. The gray bar is our Hispanic students, and the blue bar is our Pacific Islander students. There's something going on there. When we see these gaps, there's something going on. We can't just ignore that. And so we're trying to make efforts to understand it. And what we're learning is that it really is coming back to this, that um, effective part of learning. And so that's, that's a big part of what we're focusing on here. In higher education, we often have a tendency to point our finger at the student and to say that the students aren't prepared, the students don't have this, the students don't have that, and the onus is on them to figure it out. Or we can build, you know, Okay, you need to go through, jump through these hoops, take these courses before you're ready for this course. But there's also something to be said about stepping back and thinking about our own environment and thinking about how we can improve our own environment. What changes can we make to, to ensure that students who come into our classes have what they need to succeed? In the system that I teach in, we have 114 community colleges. We serve about 2.1-ish million students. And 67% of them identify as an ethnic minority. Four in 10 of them are first-gen college students. Seven out of 10 of them, this is new data that we just got this year, seven out of 10 of them experience food and housing insecurity or homelessness, experienced that in the past year. That's research from the Hope Center out of Temple University, Sarah Goldrick Rabb, who's awesome if you don't know her work. And if we look at who experienced those threats to basic needs that I just showed you, these are the identities. Transgender, bisexual, lesbian, gay, African American, black, American Indian, Alaskan Native, those over, older students, students who've been in foster care, served in the military, formerly incarcerated, and have ADHD. And the point of that slide is to really stress that identity is something that's intersectional. So when we look at like the data that we collect, it doesn't mean that we can just look to that data and think, oh, these are the students that we need to support. The point is that we need to design learning environments that are inclusive for everyone. So that whoever comes into our, 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 our classes, if we're serious about supporting student success, if we're serious about improving graduation rates, which we are in California, it's a huge focus of ours. It's about designing something, a, an environment that supports everybody. And it's also about knowing what's happening in your students' lives. We're coming out of a phase in higher education that's been very focused on equality. It's been very focused on, and this is true for me too, I'm in this too, um, teaching my classes, you know, I, I had my policies and I was all about being fair, right? I wanted to be fair to all my students, so I treated everyone equally. This is my policy. I'm sorry I can't break it for you because it wouldn't be fair to this person. Now the problem with that is that in our classes, all of our students are in different places and they all have different needs. And so if we treat everyone the same, then we are implying that everybody is the same and that everybody needs the same thing. And that's just not true. That's just not true. So when we can start to create environments that give every student what they need, we'll start to actually be st making strides towards equity, which is very different than equality. We hear these terms a lot, so um, I hope it's helpful just to break them down a little bit. 
Um, there's some research called validation theory that goes back to the work of Laura Rendon from a couple of decades ago that is used pretty significantly in community colleges. Uh, and her work, it, it's based on research with low-income groups of students. And she asked these students as they were actually about to graduate, you know, how did you get here? How did you know that you could be successful in college? And a lot of the, the themes that started to emerge from her qualitative data collection had to do with relationships. It had to do with someone reaching out, you know, remembering their name, saying things like, I believe in you, you can do this. It's those, those are the things that really make a difference to students who aren't going to be able to succeed on their own. And that's not a whole lot to do, you know? Um, so we have practices that we encourage, uh, like, you know, greet your students at the door and ask them how their day is going as they're coming in. Like, those things really matter. But then the question becomes, like, how do you do that online when I have digital technologies to mediate everything that I do with my students. Like, what does that look like? So those are questions that we've been, been asking ourselves. And as an online student, that's really important. That instructor presence is really, really important. Because without it, you end up having an experience that can feel very lonely and very isolating. And that directly connects with motivation. So I'm going to play a really quick video clip here of a student, a student that was on a student panel who's talking about his online learning experiences. I can see that a professor isn't trying to interact with the course. And it's just little things like the automatic announcements that only show up at 12 a.m. on a Sunday. Like you know it's all uh, automated. They're just not, or you leave a question and ask the professor, and three weeks later you get a response. Like, that's when I start to judge. Like, I just wish you wouldn't be here. Like, I wish you would focus your energy somewhere else because I'm not learning anything. But, yeah, so that's the only judgment is when you're not doing anything. We don't care when you make mistakes, though. We don't care when you make mistakes, though. I like repeating that last part. Um, yeah, so. I mean, there's a lot in that statement there. And I, I'm not saying that we can't use automa automated announcements. Those are super helpful because you got other things to do. And they, they ensure that you know, information gets shared, what needs to get shared. But if that's all we're doing, then where is your presence? Where's the human connection for the student who needs it? Um, and that really does tie in with motivation and encouragement, which influences learning. Um, so we use this phrase a lot, you know, um, which I think is kind of funny, but we have had students say, I've heard from faculty, I, I teach faculty development, online faculty development courses, and I remember a faculty coming into a discussion a while back and she said, you know, I reached out to one of my students and I was, you know, giving him some feedback on an assignment and he wrote back to me and said, Oh my, go oh my gosh, I always thought my online teachers were robots. I think he said computers, but same thing. You know, and that was, that was a while ago, and at the time it was startling, and I would always repeat it, like, don't ever let this happen, and it's starting to happen now. Like, right? Robots are now part of the teaching and learning landscape. So I really think about this moment that we're in as a very fragile time. And I'm not saying that like AI won't have a place, but it's not going to take your place. Like, and we need to really demonstrate that, you know, show our presence because that's the value that we bring in addition to your subject matter expertise. I know what you're thinking right now, um, but you know that that robot part. I mean, this, the future of higher education is getting very interesting, and so that human presence part, that human connection, the relationship part, can't go away if we really still want to have meaningful learning experiences in higher education and change lives, which I hope, you know, that's part of why you went into what you do. So what does that look like online? This is a video uh, from one of my colleagues. She teaches at San Diego Miramar College. Her name is Denise Maduli williams And she uses an app called Clips. C-L-I-P-S, it only is available for Apple, I'm sorry, Apple iOS mobile devices because it's actually an Apple product. 
Um, but it actually auto captions as you speak and you can go back in and edit those. And then from, from that app, you can share it out uh, through social media if you do that. She actually is present on Twitter and on Instagram, and so she shares it straight from the app, and she tells her students to follow her. And she also embeds the video in Canvas. So just take a listen and compare Matthew's experience to how Denise's students might feel. Canvas, the module's ready to go. I really enjoyed uh, meeting you and learning all about you on our week one Flipgrid and our student survey. And I can't wait to get into week two. You're going to be starting your first multi-draft essay. So as I walk on campus, I also wanted to let you know how you can find me when you're on campus. So my office is here in the H building, Humanities building. And I'm going to walk you over and show you where my office is. So you just went ahead into the faculty offices, H110, and head down the hallway. Okay, and here's some. So I think you get the point there, right? Um, so much more welcoming, much more encouraging. I follow Denise on Twitter and I watch her videos all the time and I always feel so inspired. You know, she'll reflect at the end of a module about the work the students had done and the growth that she's seen in their learning and, you know, say, really acknowledging when students are taking risks and working hard and um, it resonates differently. It really encourages you. Um, and I, I want to just embed this challenge in my presentation. If you're not a believer, try it and see what happens. Because I have people tell me all the time, actually just a day or two ago, Aloha Sergeant from Cabrillo College, she said, I recorded seven super quick, rough videos and I've used them in my online class and she's a librarian and she said, I've never had so many of my online students come into the library and find me and say hello, so give it a whirl. When, nobody, when it feels like nobody cares, students disengage. And it, when it feels like someone cares, students lean in. So think back to your experience that you reflected on at the start of this presentation. If you're reflecting on a time that you didn't feel included, however that experience ended, if it ended positively or negatively, it may have had something to do with someone reaching out. Because the antidote to that feeling, the antidote of not belonging, is human connection. We also saw in a recent study um, that looked at different course design features to try to identify which course design feature impacted student success the most. And it was determined that it was actually the quality, not the quantity, the quality of the, the uh, instructor to student interactions in online courses that affected grades, had a significant impact on grades in online courses. And this is with an uh, com online community college population, so a diverse learner, a population of diverse learners. Um, and that's really significant, especially since Think about that, student to instructor interactions, that's not even course design, right? That's, that's teaching, that's teaching. Teaching really matters. So what we do in our system to try to spread the word and the goodness and get people to engage in these, these different practices, um, we have an online course that we've designed. It's a four week online course. Um, I was the designer of the course, and we have now faculty from across our system that facilitate the course for other faculty. And uh, the course runs about four or five times a year. There's about 30 people in each course. And they go through several different um, practices. They learn different practices, and they experience different practices. They learn a lot about social presence, which has a significant amount of, of, there's a lot of research that's been done around social presence. It's the degree to which a person is perceived as real in mediated communication. And the research shows that when social presence goes up, student satisfaction, interaction, and perceived depth of learning increases. So if you think about something like a discussion that you think is pretty well designed, if you're still not getting engagement, 
it's shown that increasing your social presence will actually increase that engagement, as well as the social presence of your students. You can have activities for them to share something about themselves and become understood as real people by their peers. So this is a reflection from a participant of our humanizing course. Um, he said, this is a faculty member, I almost wanted to quit the evening the short video was due. The empathy shown by Michelle drove me to want to get it done. If nothing else, to let her know believing in me did not go unnoticed or unappreciated. I used to have the belief that I have very little to do with the success of my online students. I used to tell them that I, ha all <clears throat> I have all the math videos made. All the resources are there for them, and eventually it's up to them to succeed. And while I still believe parts of the statements, I was very wrong in saying I have little to do in their success. So having our faculty be immersed in a type of humanized environment where they know I'm there and I'm, I'm helping them and supporting them is really making an impact or whoever's facilitating the course. So what we're really trying to encourage our faculty to do is to, to shift their lens. And it's hard to do, but sitting in the seat of a student really does help you see things differently and think about what you're doing differently. Um, this is a tweet from Todd Conaway, who's in a faculty development role at University of Washington. Uh, he says, things I get to see from the land of happy syllabus language. Please do not approach the professor with questions right before class begins as she's setting up. So that's one of the things we're trying to get faculty to do is look at your syllabus and read it as if you're a student with all of this stuff in mind. Students are hesitant. They're reluctant to reach out for help. And if they open a syllabus and they see it filled with red language and things that you shouldn't, and, you know, shouldn't do, it doesn't really motivate them to make that leap and lean over and ask for help. So one of the things we're encouraging our faculty to think about is what we call a, a liquid syllabus. Hi scholars, my name is Katie Lippman Coughlin and I'm going to be your instructor this semester. A little bit about me, I lived in the Central Valley of California for a lot of years. So that's just a clip from Katie's um, liquid syllabus, but the concept here is to send a welcome email a week before the course starts, which is a pretty well-known effective practice for online teaching. And in that welcome email, include a link, say click here to learn more about our course. And instead of clicking there and having to go log in, which for some students is no big deal, for some students if it's their first semester and often don't progress to their next semester if they're not successful, it is a barrier. So instead of clicking and going to Canvas, they click and they go to a public website which is the liquid syllabus. This, our, we are, we're having faculty use Google Sites. It could be done with any web authoring tool. But essentially, it's like a getting started package. It's the stuff that they really need to know. It's the stuff that students usually have questions about right off the bat. And at the very top, because it's a web page, there's the ability to embed a really quick, friendly video from their instructor. And from there, they go into the course when the course begins. So that's just another example there that I'm going to click past. When they get into the course, another humanizing practice number two is a visually appealing and dynamic home page. So thinking about the aesthetic design of the course, being sure that there's a really clear start here area. And this is a home page from our humanizing online teaching and learning course that this particular course was co-facilitated by Mike and Tracy. And this is what our faculty participants would see. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our homepage. Page. I'm Mike Spencer. And I'm Tracy Shalen. Click the Start Here button to go to the first page in our Getting Started module. This module will get you oriented to our class. We'll, we'll see, see you there. there. So getting faculty th to think a little bit differently about what that homepage, how it could be a little bit more welcoming and inviting, and ensuring that students know where to go to get started. Um, and then we have this thing that we like to encourage folks to do called video postcards. And again, this is modeled in the course. Let me, let me say this. A big outcome of this course, and this is huge for faculty, is using their smartphone to record simple, unedited videos. Rose and I had a good conversation about this today and how important that is. Because when all, everything they see is glossy perfection, even if you're using video, 
it makes them more reluctant that they're going to make mistakes. But when they see that you're real and not perfect, it helps students. It helps students a lot to understand you as a real person, and they're, they're again, more willing to lean in. But a video postcard is a video. Go somewhere else. You, a smartphone, right? You can go anywhere. Like, go to a context that relates to your discipline. Go, go sit by your fireplace. Hold your dog in your backyard. I mean, lots of different things. Or walk around campus. Um, but this is kind of a fun one from Tracy. Hi, everyone. For this week's introductory video, I am coming to you from the My Gas Station. Why not? I'm here until the tank fills, and replenishing my fuel makes me think about where I'm headed. Not just in my car, but also where we're headed in our course. So she goes on with like the weekly announcement at that point. And she said to me when she shared this video with me, she's like, Michelle, I was so busy that week. I didn't have any other time to do it. She's like, so I just got really creative. And you know, that's something that can come out in those videos too. Like I'm recording from here because this is where I am today. Um, and again, that sense of, that sense of you're, you're struggling too. I mean, you've got a lot going on in your life too, and you're working really hard. And that doesn't always come out in these perfect you know, glossy videos from, from, from done in studios, which I'm very jealous of your studios. I'm not saying don't use them, but this is a different kind of video. And so the participants in our course, and there's a huge amount of reluctance around this. As I'm sure you all understand, it's hard, especially to not be perfect. So the first thing we have them do, record your smartphone, record a video with your smartphone, but don't be in the video. You can if you want, but you don't have to be. So we get people, but there has to be an audio track. We get tours of backyards. We get introductions to dogs. You know, that, they're not in the first video. The point is how to do it, how to use your phone, right? Don't hold it this way, hold it this way. That's another thing that, that, that they learn. And then they actually do an upload into YouTube. They let the auto captions process, and then they learn how to edit the captions, and then they that's what they, this, they submit the link for that assignment. And we hear things like, I had no idea that was so easy. Oh my gosh, my teenager now thinks I'm cool. You know, all different dimensions of um, success come out of that. And then they build on that. This is feedback from one of our participants. I sent students my first video postcard and received a gushing email from a student who was planning to drop, but then saw he had a kind teacher and decided to stay. And we see this left and right. And then there's this technique that we call adaptive teaching, which sounds really fancy, but it really isn't. It's important as an online instructor, it's important for, as an instructor across the board to know the stories of your students. But when you're online, it's even more important or else those names on a screen become very dehumanized. There's a real complex story behind every single one of those names. Um, and you only have so much to go around, right? I mean, you can't, you can't give everyone high touch interactions. We can do the, the quick video to the whole class, but some students need more than that. And it's not a lot. So what we encourage um, faculty to do, we have a survey that is adaptable. You can actually go to this URL um, and make a copy of it if, you're in, if, you have, if you use Google Forms or just copy the questions. But my two favorite questions in that survey are, in one word, describe how you're feeling about this class. And this is the first week. Responses to that question can be fine, good, okay, you know, but then there are these other ones that fall into a different category, overwhelmed, anxious, scared. And from my experience, a class of about 40 students, I usually had three or four that would fall into that category, and those are the ones that I would reach out to right away. Hey, you're going to get through this, you know. Um, and then loop into this next question. Please share one thing that may interfere with your success in this class. A lot of times we hear, uh, I'm not good with technology, um, but we hear things like, my mom is on hospice, and I'm her primary caregiver. I'm pregnant, and I'm going to deliver in week 12. I just got back from Afghanistan, and I have PTSD. Like, those are real stories. And having those people Having a, an instructor who's going to reach out and just say, I hear you, I listen to your concern, let me know how I can help you. And a lot of times that's all they need, is just knowing that there's someone there. And as you're teaching your course, if that person starts falling off the grid, right? I like to keep those notes, I make notes from that survey in the notes column in Canvas. 
And if someone falls off the grid, you can go right back and look at and like, oh, she's delivering her baby right about this time or, you know, but just a check in with a specific reference to what's going on in their life. That's humanizing. This is another reflection. My communications with students have uncovered so many of the obstacles my students are facing that I would have no idea about. The cool thing is that I've been able to refer them to resources on or off campus. It's been eye-opening in so many ways that something so simple could mean so much. And a lot of faculty say that they start enjoying teaching online more because it's not so just put the content out there and do the grading. It really does help them feel a sense of um, reward interacting with their students. Telling stories, there's a lot of um, research that goes behind this, but one that I like to just reference is that it's been shown that lis or listening to someone tell a story fosters empathy in the listener. And there's been research done, MRI, vi visual, visual research, um, visual, vi MRIs of the brain, whatever I'm trying to say, that show that uh, the person telling the story, the same parts of their brain will light up as the person listening. And so that is a form of connection. So bringing storytelling into your class, telling stories about like, oh, we're used, I remember when I was a college student and this is where I was and you know, this is what I didn't know and this is, this is how I've progressed and gotten to where I was. It wasn't an easy, easy pathway, but I did it. Um, can really foster empathy and also help students to develop a more growth mindset themselves. So this is a video from one of our participants. This is an excerpt of a tool that we use called Flipgrid. Um, so this is a faculty member, again, checking in in, in our, our icebreak or our check-in in our interhumanizing course. Hey, everybody. My name is Syl Arena. Syl is short for Sylvester. I teach digital photography at Custer College in San Luis Obispo. I'm down at Morro Strand, the beach that runs from the town of Morro Bay, where I live, all the way up to Cayucos on the central coast. And I'm down here with my sweet dog, Ruby, That's a story, right? That's a story. I guarantee you, you're going to remember Ruby for a very, very long time, and you're going to remember Syl. I just had an email interaction with Syl the other day, and, and he said, I asked how Ruby was, and he said, Ruby passed away one year ago yesterday, and we had a toast to her at dinner last night. You know, but that's the kind of stuff that really sticks with you. It really sticks with you. It makes a difference. So this is a one-minute video that was created with Adobe Spark video. It's a free tool. Again, we're all about free. Um, and this was created by Michelle McFarland, who teaches agriculture at Sierra College. And in her online course, she had a, 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 a discussion group called the Latin. No, I don't know, it was a Q&A discussion where students could post questions. And she changed the name of that discussion to the truck stop. And she posted this video to explain why. The truck stop may seem like an odd name for a discussion board designed for student interaction. Well, there's a story that makes it the perfect name for such a place. This is a picture of me and my dog, Lulu. I was about five years old. This part of my childhood, I spent living in a small town called Roxton in Eastern Texas. This town was really small. It was an agricultural town and there was not much there. My dad was a farmer. We lived on a large farm way out of town. On the weekends and during the summer, there was nothing more that I, that I looked forward to other than going to the truck stop. 
A truck stop is a facility that's usually by a highway and includes a diner, fuel pumps, and other services for long haul truckers. Truck stops often serve locals too. In my childhood experience, it was where the farmers went for breakfast. It was more than just a place to grab some food though. It was a place where the local agricultural community came alive. As I sat and enjoyed my pancakes, politics, commodity prices, the weather, and the latest town gossip were exchanged. Deals were made and laughs were shared. In a time before cell phones, social media, and instant messaging, the truck stop on the outskirts of Roxton, Texas served as a discussion forum for the locals. Nice story about Michelle, nice tie into her instructional design, helps the students get to know a little bit about herself. One minute video, right? Of course, it didn't take her one minute to make that video, but Adobe Spark video is pretty fabulous. So she mentioned cell phones in that last, um, in that last clip there. This is just a moment to pause and reflect on this huge change that we've been through. This is in a photo taken in 2005, the day that a new pope was, are they called, is it called elected? selected, I don't know what the correct term is. And in 2013, we had another pope selected. Photo taken from same place. Like that change is phenomenal. And it, I'm, I'm showing you this because, I mean, I could just show you data about phones, but it's the fact that phones are being used to document experiences, right? I don't know why we even call them phones anymore. I mean, how many people really make phone calls regularly? Um, I mean, I have, I have a doctor's office trying to reach me for the past four days. I'm like, I just can't remember to keep call, call, to call that person back. So this change is significant. And I really think this is an opportunity for us as educators. Um, more undergraduates own smartphones than computers. Let that sink in for a little bit. So what if we started using those phones, like intentionally using those phones for assignments? To get students to go take pictures of things, to take videos of things, to document examples of things from your course. What else could we do with phones? Um, I used VoiceThread as a, it's a tool for asynchronous voice and video discussion in my courses, teaching online. And one of my students, Deborah, who's shown on the screen here, um, shared with me that she had a student who was a, a, a daughter who was disabled. And this is her, her uh, daughter, Kirsten. She was born with hydrocephalus and is permanently intubated. And um, so I learned that about Deborah from the survey. And she was, a, she was a great student. But I noticed about Deborah, when, when we did our voice thread discussions, you could use your webcam. You could type your answers, you could record them from your computer, but there was also the option of using an app. And so I gave my students all the options that they wanted. And I surveyed them about different, different points to find out who was using what. But I, Deborah was one of the few students who always did video and I could tell she was on her phone because it was kind of wobbly. And I learned at the end of the course that she did that because it allowed her to sit next to her daughter Getting away from the computer allowed her to sit next to her daughter and do her homework. And that made me think about mobile phones totally differently. And the types of students who are enrolling in online courses because they don't have the privilege to get to campus. So that really resonated with me. I'm gonna skip past that video. And it kind of begs the question, like why do we not do more with, with having students speak? Um, that's something to ask ourselves. We're, we're having more and more students earn degrees online without having to speak. So we have these things called phones, you know? It's like we have students nowadays are walking around with multimedia studios in their pockets. You know, 10 years ago, it would be like, oh, that would be so great. And well, it happened, it's, it's there now. Um, so voice and video discussions are something else that we do uh, encourage and that we model in the course. We use Flipgrid. Um, which is free for educators. It's, it was recently purchased by Microsoft, and so now it's free for educators, and it's asynchronous discussions. And that asynchronicity is very important for online students who are not able to be all together at the same time. I love Zoom, and I use it all the time, 
with my colleagues, but it can be a barrier for online students. And then of course there's also the option in Canvas to record voice or video into a discussion reply. When I was doing voice and video um, discussions, I did some surveying of my students and this is what I learned. 83% of a student sample of 82 said, when I spoke, I remembered the information better. 95% said, listening to peers increased my ability to achieve the learning objectives. A multimodal environment, that's the world we live in, right? And so making our students' online learning experiences, all of our students' experiences multimodal, that's an opportunity that digital tools bring to us. And listening to my peers made me feel more connected to them. 86% of 109 students agreed or strongly agreed to that. I have one quote from a student that I didn't put in here. I remember the quote that she said, I was at my son's Taekwondo practice and I recognized another student from our class from the sound of her voice. And I thought that was really cool. So Janet Mitchell Lambert teaches English at Cerritos College in California, and she uses a tool called Flipgrid, um, which is the clip that Sill's video is taken from. So imagine you're getting this prompt that you're a student, says, find a place that reminds you of a poem you read for a class and share what it is, state why, and share a couple of lines in the poem. And then you could hear it from Janet. Hey there, so for this week's Flipgrid, what I would like you to do is find one of the poems that touched you this week and find a place in your house or outside that reminds you of the poem. Share the place in the video and then go ahead and share why. So I'm going to show a clip. These are shared with student permission. This is a student. So we were in my father's house. And uh, this is actually the bedroom here. And it reminds me of the fact that my parents are divorced. And the Billy Collins poem, Divorce, <laughs> is quite apropos for the situation. So I'm going to stop it there just because of time. But prompts like that and giving students the ability to go find a place that connects with something they're learning about and tell why they picked it, like that allowed for him to draw upon his personal experiences and it validates a student. It makes their experiences feel like they mean something. And it also serves as a catalyst to start talking about poetry, right? Now, Jana teaches writing. So obviously her students don't do all of video, right? But she sees huge value in these, these types of video activities to scaffold students towards writing and get rid of some of that, that anxiety that comes with writing. I'm gonna skip past this one. Um, and so this is an example of a voice thread. I just put this in here to show you what it looks like. Uh, this is one student speaking in uh, an audio comment and the prompt on the screen is one that I've put here for them. Um, this started with a, a video intro by me, so I'll just play a little bit of this video. As Jana and Melinda discussed, Stieglitz was moved by the shapes in this image. Um, the man in the straw hat was mentioned, and the, the crossed suspenders, the fennel leaning left. He liked how contrasting with the fennel was the stick. So it gives students that option to also annotate uh, which is a pretty cool way to demonstrate your knowledge of something, particularly if it's a visual discipline. Um, VoiceThread does have auto captioning built in if you have a certain license tier. I just want to point that out. It didn't have captioning turned on on that one. Um, and then lastly, my last example is non-disposable assignments. And something that I really believe is if I really believe in meaningful learning. I have a 17 and 19 year old who are very tuned out from school because it's not meaningful to them. And when I think about our students coming into our colleges and universities and then going into the real world, if they're only learning in a learning management system, 
They're not going to be prepared for demonstrating their abilities in the real world. There's a lot to be said about creating a digital profile for oneself that sets you apart from others and showing students how to do that. So when they go to LinkedIn after they graduate, which everyone tells them to do, it's like, great, what do I put here? I could put you know, the name of the college that I graduated from and what I graduated with. But what if they had things they could actually link to? So turning our students from passive consumers into active creators of content, I know this is kind of a big, bigger one, but that's something to think about. And how could you do that? Do you have an assessment that maybe you could give students options to, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be done in a writing. Maybe you can give them a different, a different option to demonstrate their knowledge. I had a, an assignment in my uh, history photography course. I had my students find a photographer anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, make contact with that photographer and interview that photographer. And I had a specific like rubric of things they had to learn. They had to get permission to use a certain number of their images, the photographer's images, in a voice thread that they created about their work. And then they did a presentation in voice thread about the artist's work. Um, I had one student who the photographer said to the student, this is so great. Can you give me the embed code so I can put it on my website? Talk about feeling validated. And then um, this link is on our resource site, but Adobe Voice uh, is another uh, tool that you can have students create videos with or give it as an option. This video um, from Matt Mooney's class is um, it's, a, it's done by, a, I heard the student speak about creating this video, it was amazing. You don't get it from watching the video, but um, it's, it's about the civil rights movement. It's a very powerful video, but she talked about how she, uh, her great grandfather was actually black. And when she learned about all the things that were going on um, in the earlier 20th century, it just helped her understand her own identity so much more. And so, you know, she said, if I was just taking a test or, you know, I probably wouldn't have gotten into it as much as I did. So here, these, this instructor, Matt Mooney, um, gave essential questions and her, the students had, could, they could pick any essential question and then basically create a video off of it, a video about it. And this link here is a um, Make Your Own Museum Digital Curation Project by Meg Phelps, who teaches art, appreci art appreciation online. And this is the actual student project right here. Students had to come up with a theme. They had certain um, topics that they had to write about. So there's a rubric with this. And then they had to organize art into different rooms that also had themes. So this is done with Adobe Spark page. And if I go back to the assignment, um, this is a, a quote from one of Meg's students. This was a very unique, enjoyable project. I felt we really had a chance to show what we learned while getting creative ourselves. It was also very challenging for me. Even coming up with a theme was a challenge, but I had a lot of fun with it. It was a lot of work, but it really gives us a chance to show what we have learned. And so there you have it, folks. A liquid syllabus, a visually appealing dynamic. Oh, I didn't talk about dynamic. Homepage, video postcards, adaptive teaching, tell stories, video, voice discussions, and non disposable assignments. Real quick, a dynamic homepage is a homepage that changes when students come into it. So it doesn't have to be every module. We have a lot of instructors who do that, though. They created just a home page that has a small variation and that they, they have it unpublished in Canvas. So when, it's, when the new module opens, they publish the next one and it just changes. And that also shows your presence in a different way, right? Because the, the content is always current. And I, I want to leave you with one thought. Um, how to get there, how we make this happen. Technology is not our barrier. And learning to use technology is not a barrier. That's not, the, that's not the challenge. The challenge is getting ourselves to be willing to make that leap. Relationships start with psychological safety, which requires us to take off our armor and be vulnerable. We wear a lot of armor as academics, 
we've, we look back to the professors that we've had and it feels difficult. It's hard. And I recognize it's hard. It's so hard. Um, making that leap is incredibly difficult because it requires us to be vulnerable. But Brene Brown, who I'm a huge fan of, I um, have to leave, lose, end with a quote by Brene Brown, when we start losing our tolerance for vulnerability, uncertainty, and risk-taking, we move away from the things that we need and crave the most, like joy and love and belonging, trust, empathy, and creativity. And it's my hope that those things will stay at the center of teaching and learning, because that's how we are going to continue to change lives with what we do. So that's my hope for you, is that you'll reflect on that a little bit and maybe be willing to try one thing. And thank you for being such a captive audience. <laughs> thank you. I'm happy to have a conversation about any of this stuff, if you have any questions that you want to ask. Or tell me I'm crazy, or? So I'm a new PhD student here in technical communication and rhetoric, and I'm studying this kind of thing, like oh, really? personalizing online spaces and creating places for students to learn online. And one of the most common <clears throat> things that I hear from reluctant, like people who are reluctant to te teach online, is this idea of that their personality, like their teaching is about their personality in the classroom, and they just can't see how that could change. And I think a lot of what you've covered addresses some of that, but what are some things that you would say to someone who, you know, wasn't gonna come sit and listen to a, a full presentation where you can say, just some quick ways that I, I guess to kind of make them feel like it was possible yeah if that makes sense so you're talking about shifting mindsets and honestly the the mindset shifts that we see and and that this is the hard part because like you said how do you get them to sit through it but the people in our courses who come in with those barriers and the transformation we see um you know but another another thing that that can work is to share our practices. Um, I'm going to actually be starting to write a series of blog posts about different humanizing practices. And there's something to be said, like there's a lot of faculty who won't come to a workshop, they're not going to take a course. But you know what, if they see a link about something, they might click on it and they might read an article or, or see a video. And so that's something else that we're trying to mix up. We do something called Pocket PD to try to grab people who only have five minutes. Um, so, I mean, it's, it is all about sharing. It, I, I, I'm a firm believer that the biggest way to get an instructor, a faculty member to try something new is to see a peer do it. Because it just, it doesn't mean they're gonna do it the same way, but it'll resonate with them and they'll say, oh, I could, I could do it like this, or it, it sparks new ideas. So, I mean, that, that, who else has a suggestion for that great question? Anyone else? Keep nudging. <laughs> it's hard work. Yeah. And at the same time, if someone doesn't want to teach online, they, maybe they shouldn't teach online, you know? I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, I really appreciate your lecture. It was very insightful. Um, I teach online, um, and I teach a geography class, and I really um, like implementing a lot of the suggestions you have. I have some of them already in my class, but there okay. are some more that like always pushing, right, to be better and more connected with the students. Um, so in my critiques and my feedback that I get, um, how do I wanna say this? I have a lot of non-traditional students. I have students that are working 40-hour week jobs. They're going home to families and children and um, are taking 18 credits and things like that. And I get responses to my material as in, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. So I'm having a hard time linking the value of these assignments for my online students um, 
to as a priority, mm -hmm. right? So I have them maybe four to six hours a week dedicating to my class. Mm -hmm. If I don't make every bit of that essential and important, then I'm getting that feedback. So I, I have difficulty making these assignments because I think they're a great idea and I start implementing them like I don't even get this. And that's not based around like my explanation because that's not what it is, but the fact of the matter that they can't sit down at a computer and just do this, that they actually have to go out and do something. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, my problem might be is how do I better integrate this material with the reasoning that this is important or this is the way that is benefiting them? Mm -hmm. So there's a few things I would say is, I mean, it sounds like you've already reflected on is there too much? I mean, that could be a reality. I mean, I haven't seen your course. And then I'm hearing you say about like that barrier of having to go out and do something whenever I have that coming up in a course, like letting students know significantly in advance, having that be laid out and marked so that they know, hey, in week seven, you're gonna have to go do this. As a reminder, next week, you're gonna have to go do this. Those things are really helpful. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, it sounds like, you know, having too much work is something that it just, it comes down to good course design, you know, and it comes down to how many of your students are saying that? Is that a significant number? Um, I, I guess I just, I have a lot of questions about unwrapping that and understanding what's going on underneath the hood. But I also know that the reason I asked that question is it, it's human nature for us to focus on maybe a class of 40 students and you get those two uh, I see heads shaking, you know, and you remember those two, and they make you think you have to go back and redo everything. I mean, that's human nature. So, I mean, quantify that feedback and really ask yourself, is it something that you, you do need to act on, or is it just our nature as humans to really, I mean, I remember those horrible comments that I got in my reviews from like 20 years ago. It's like, I still remember them word by every letter of the, you know, that's just our human nature. So. I don't know, I guess I just want to unpack that a little bit. It's hard, but who, who else has suggestions? Anyone else? I don't feel like I had a good answer for you, but yeah. I, I mean, I think in some ways, like, it's difficult that this feedback came at the, you know, at the end of it, right? Yeah. Like, if, it could, if it could have came like at that moment, I think there's, a, there's an element of being sympathetic and, and being humanized at that moment, right? If you have, if, if you have any problems with this, you know, like on your on your course, if you have any problems with this assignment, please let me know. You know, like uh, this is the principle. This is what we're trying to learn. If you have other, you know, like things that might work to fulfill this requirement, like I'm open to that. You know, like like in the course that I teach, I just try to be flexible because I understand. Like, there's a lot of students that kind of are in that same yeah. category. You know, I've had a student, a class I teach. One of the things I like to have the students do is create a like a LinkedIn profile. Uh, and I said, you know, this is the principle and this is why we're doing LinkedIn and this is why it's important. Uh, but I was open if students felt like they didn't want to do that or this is something that wasn't right for them. And had a student that had a situation where it just wasn't right for her to create a LinkedIn profile, but she did something else that fulfilled that requirement, you know, kind of fit with her, her own personal situation. So, I mean, I, th I think there, there's an opportunity and maybe, yeah. that's, maybe that's what it is, like that's, get some feedback that's... before, you know, like, Get that that feedback at the time so that you can be be human, you know, and, right. and be flexible for the students' needs. Um, yeah, that that's a good point. Surveys, kind of check-in points during the term. I did have, I I started answering your question and I wanted to share a practice and then I got sidetracked and I forgot what it was. But let me just share this because maybe it'll spark an idea for you. I shared this earlier in my conversation, but there's another practice that we use called the wisdom wall. And we use, I, I encourage a voice tool for this. Like it works great with Flipgrid, um, but you could do it at the end. This is what I've done at the end of my course. I have students reflect back to the beginning of the course. And I ask them to think about what it was like at the beginning of the course. And what do you know now that you wish you had known then? And how could you frame that as a piece of advice? for my students coming in next semester. And then I share those comments with my incoming students. So when the students are coming into the class and they're feeling overwhelmed and this is gonna be a lot of work, they hear students who say, I was so overwhelmed, you know, but 
this is what I did and these are the strategies and you know, log in first thing on Tuesday and review the module and all the stuff that we would tell our students but when they hear it from other students it resonates differently and I really do believe there's something about hearing other students like hearing about their struggle and how they got through it it sets them up for, for more success. So, and you could do that after an exam, you know, there's lots of different ways that could be implemented into a course, but think about that because it might start to shift some dynamics in the course. Hi. So I don't have a great answer, but what, what I think theoretically would be ideal would be to create a customizable by the student learning path. So the student you described may be one who would want to go straight to the assessments and understand what they do and do not know and then focus on that rather than the the more interactive or or rich path that that other students might enjoy and i think that's that can be done in a well-designed uh, course where here's your fast path here's the you know the path for the novice here's the past path for someone who thinks they have a pretty good mastery already and so on So I try to integrate different technologies into my course, and I don't know how, how, what are some ways that you've used to get older non-traditional students to integrate technology and videos and things into the courses? Because I do give them options if they mm -hmm. want to do certain things. And then I get younger students who decide that that's important, but older students try to avoid it like the plague. Mm -hmm. Like we have a Facebook page where I, post questions for the, uh, for the exam where they get to answer together and I post announcements of hey don't forget that this pop quiz is closing and things like that but I have students who obviously don't like Facebook which is fine mm -hmm. um, and it's extra credit but there are other technologies like on their phone to be able to record videos to help them with their discussion posts and how do you encourage that? You encourage it. <laughs> no but um, I told a story earlier about a student I had that um, she was in her 50s and they were doing, they were going to have to do voice threads and they also had to keep a blog that they were writing reflective prompts on that aligned with our assignments and she was one that I identified as overwhelmed in that survey and I reached out to her, her name was Diane and she said it's the technology, she said I have no interest in this, I'm not a, I'm not a millennial, I'm not I, I don't like social media, I see no use for it, and I explained to her why it was that we were doing it, and the evidence that I had from past courses about how it did connect students with each other, and how it did help them learn, it did help them want to come back to the course and stay connected. Um, it is important to be able to justify why you're doing what you're doing, um, and know who you need to have that conversation with. And I said, listen, you know, and she was like on the verge of quitting. I said, hey, stick in, stick with it for a week and let's check in next week and see how you're doing. And by the next week, she was doing significantly better. She hung in there. At the end of the course, she came back to me and she said, Michelle, I just got a job with a local newspaper writing blog posts for them. So if you can demonstrate in some way about, you know, the, the value of skills that will apply to life, that that's that's another way to think about it as well but I do think it's important for us to be able to justify why we're asking students to do things so so I, I really appreciated uh, the presentation um, and this is me being an academic, uh, how do I measure the quality? I mean, if the success, key success criteria is to have a quality instructor-student interaction, how do I measure that? Mm. Uh, it, unless it comes after the fact, in which case I can't really fix that specific uh, quality yeah, issue. and there's, that's actually a, an emerging research space right now. How do we measure the quality of interactions? I mean, what what my sense is with the faculty that I'm interacting with that are employing these strategies is that the quality of the interactions feeds into the engagement level. Like that's how it's measured. When you start seeing the impact and the students coming back and doing even maybe like more than they're expected to do, that's 
in my view, tied to the quality of interactions. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, a rubric, I don't have that for you. But seeing that change in engagement is something that is a big indicator, in, in my view, anyway. But let's watch that space. Maybe you want to do some research in that space. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that it's just now emerging. Like the, the, the quality of interactions is, is an important part of it. And I do have that, uh, um, that resource, the source on that slide on the website. And if you read through that, you'll get a better sense by what they mean by quality. Um, I just don't have that at the top of my head. Do you have a sense of how predictive peer-to-peer -peer interaction, like those types of um, interactions are in terms of engagement and success? Um, is it less than the instructor interaction or similar? Or yeah, I don't know if I can go to that granular of a level, but so much of this depends on who our students are. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who don't need that interaction. The students that we serve, they are more successful when they do have that interaction um, because of so much of the, the, the mindset barriers that they come into to college with. So, I, 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 so much of that comes down to who we're serving. I think in higher education, it, we, we have these big conversations and just make the assumption that students are students, but students aren't students. There's a lot of variation there. So, um, you know, like people can go into MOOCs and, and, and learn with thousands of people and get through the other end and be successful. But when we tried to implement that at the undergraduate level, I mean, it was disastrous. So um, I think it really depends. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that, Travis? One of the things that I've been looking at a lot uh, as far as interaction in the class is along the social presence aspect that Michelle's been talking about, but that relates to um, the community of inquiry framework, if you're familiar with that. Um, so there is, there's quite a lot uh, of literature on the topic of social presence. Uh, again, I don't think it, at least what I've read doesn't go to that granular level of comparing instructor to student interaction versus student to student interaction. However, a lot of the literature does speak to the importance of that social presence in a, especially in the online courses and engaging students in, in those uh, interactive spaces. Yeah, so the instructor presence fuels the peer-to-peer -peer interaction so it, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of problematic to break the two apart yeah yeah <laughs> any other final questions you you're troopers sticking in here till five o'clock i'm very impressed <laughs> thank you <laughs> Thank you so much for your for your for having me here. I really like I said enjoyed my time here. It's been fabulous.